first of all, um, I, hope, I hope no one thinks I'm a Trump supporter. I'm really not. He's a horrible guy. Um, he's uh, he's a, a right-wing populist, anti racist demagogue, basically anti-worker. His um, he talked about draining the swamp, but he really horrible corporate predators in his cabinet, uh, his corporate tax card, his uh, one thing after another, uh, the way he handled the pandemic is horrific. So yeah, I, I no way support Trump, of course not. But I think that almost by definition, so many people were misreading, misunder badly misreading what's been going on, the, the current political moment. So first of all, um, uh, well, liberals, by definition, a lot of people on the radical left, there's been this taking Trump out of context and all a historical hysteria whipped up around Trump. Uh, first of all, yeah, first, um, okay, the Democrats basically created Trump, uh, the Podesta emails. So John Podesta was uh, one of the main campaign managers of Hillary Clinton in 2016. He was a longtime Clinton operative close to the Clintons. Uh, so he had part of the WikiLeaks revelation, several batches of, of leaks that they published. They weren't hacks, uh, they were leaks. John Podesta, by the way, his uh, internet security showed staggering levels of incompetence for someone who's a manager of a major political campaign. At one point, he left his smartphone in a taxi for a few hours, returned, I guess, a few hours later. Uh, another point, his, um, his internet password was literally password. It's kind of insane. But anyway... The Podesta email showed emails back and forth with people in the, in the Clinton campaign showing efforts to entice Donald Trump to run, uh, Donald Trump and Ted Cruz to run as a foil, like they were considered bozo characters, no one wrote for him. Uh, back then, uh, Jeb Bush was the presumptive, the official front runner in the Republican campaign and he quickly bombed out. Uh, and Trump was regarded as an absurd figure. No one would vote for him. So they were putting him up as a foil, as easy foil. And it turned out backfired on the Clinton people very badly. Uh, interesting stuff about that. First of all, um, the uh, clearly Clinton actually won the campaign by two and a half million votes. Uh, the like, three states which threw the Electoral College, interestingly, had the three highest casualty rates in the Iraq War. And also Clinton people, Clinton, Clinton, Bill Clinton's administration, the, uh, the famous um, NAFTA was, was passed, uh, the opposition of unions. And it's complicated debate how much that was a part of deindustrialization in the areas in the U.S., but it played a role as widely popular, considered part of it. And Hillary Clinton was associated with that. Hillary was also actually wrote the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, like a type of uh, type of market, type of uh, free market integration in Asia, uh, designed to leave China out. And people called NAFTA on steroids. Hillary Clinton later backed away from it, but uh, uh, she wrote it. So anyway, and I don't know if that was a major campaign issue, but it was certainly a part of it. Uh, during the time, a friend of mine who is at Standing Rock, she's a long-time, long-term socialist for decades, she went to the Standing Rock protest with her young son, and she drove back through the Midwest. The story I heard, she drove back through the Midwest, through town after town, devast economically devastated, uh, huge drug problems, meth, uh, fentanyl problems. Just, and she, it was like many areas had a state of like total despair. She called it capitalist nihilism. Uh, I was utter despair. And just at, around the time Trump was on the TV, Trump, she saw Trump speak and he said, I represent change. I'm going to change things. And my friend said that, yeah, that's when she knew Trump would win. And I think he's right. People knew Hillary Clinton had nothing for it, had nothing for it. People said more wars. People knew damn well. And Hillary's deplorables comment, a basket full of deplorable people, People who supported Trump were a basket full of deplorables. It was a type of liberal elitism. Hillary came off as like a scolding fifth grade school teacher whom everyone hates. And uh, Trump was like the, 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 the class clown who's leading a rebellion. So it's kind of understandable why, you know, why some people would gravitate towards him. Trump was a con, con artist himself. He didn't offer anything, of course, but that's the situation. No one did. Okay, so then um, after Hillary Clinton lost the election, by the way, there was a book that came out, I'll try to find it, it was called 
Hillary wrote a book shortly after, about, I don't know, maybe six months after the election, said, uh, what happened? The title of her book was What Happened? And it was by Hillary Clinton, and then she said, Hillary Clinton. And people were joking, it was like the only book uh, that had both the question and the answer in the title. What happened? Hillary Clinton. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so shortly after Trump won, uh, Hillary Clinton lost. There was some brief examination within the Democratic Party, like why do we put up this neoliberal hack like Hillary Clinton? That was very quickly shut down by Russiagate. There was a steady stream for three, maybe close to four years of Russia, blaming Russia. Russia, Russia. No, maybe we shouldn't have put up this neoliberal hack. No, it was Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. Um, it's a myth that all 17 security agencies um, uh, signed on to Russiagate. It's actually cooked up by a group around James Clapper, and enormous pressure was was pushed was put on uh, put on the security agencies. Interestingly, the, the the intelligence agencies, one of them include Coast Guard intelligence. Like, why would they have any involvement in this? But some of them later backed away from it a bit. But the narrative, the media narrative, was Russia, Russia, Russia. None of it was ever proven. None of it. The uh, um, the uh, Mueller Mueller report was a dud. Came out and did, seriously came out with nothing. Uh, Mueller's testimony for before Congress was even worse. He came off like a doddering fool. The media built him up as some ramrod conservative, but ramrod straight 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 shooter. He ran the FBI and he ran these under under Bush and, and tra ran these entrapment operations, which ruined people's lives. So he's a hard, like, morning. Anyway, so this Russiagate narrative, it fulfilled several and quite insidious roles. One thing, it shut down criticism of the Democratic Party, classic deflection. Like, why don't we, there couldn't be any uh, exploration of the corruption. The WikiLeaks leaks, what WikiLeaks published showed the actual corruption, massive corruption within the Democratic Party. That was shut down as blaming Russia, 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 Russia. Um, it reached um, hyst uh, hysteria, a level of hysteria. At uh, one point, I forget when it was, but the Washington Post had this article uh, said that a, uh, one of the, the um, electrics or the, the, the power company, one of the main power companies in Vermont, I used to live in Vermont actually, like central Vermont power, CVP or whatever, uh, said that they had laptops which used chips made in Russia which had a back door, potential back door to Russian Russian security. The Russians could potentially sabotage it. As they would shut off the power in the middle of the winter. Uh, a couple of days later, maybe I think as long as a week later, they retracted it. It was nonsense. It wasn't true. They had to say it wasn't true. But the damage was done. The idea was out. The Russians are hacking our power grid. And Rachel Maddow, who was really famous for this, she had a, um, she, she actually had a, she said, I have no evidence to back this up but she had this hypothetical scenario that the Russians were going to take down the power grid. And I think it was Northern, what Northwestern state, like Montana or Wyoming, where it's known, maybe Montana, I think where it's known to be bitter cold in the winter, winter time, the Russians were going to shut down the power grid, sabotage, shut down the power grid. There's no evidence whatsoever, but Rachel Maddow ran with this like his, like hysteria level of, it was like really whipping up a war fever towards Russia, which is dangerous. They have nuclear, well, they have Russia's nuclear weapons. Uh, doesn't mean I support Putin or like the Russian government, but they had nothing to do. They had actually nothing to do with getting Trump elected, really. It was, the whole thing was extremely insidious, dangerous narrative. So it filled a couple of roles, shut down criticism of the Democratic Party, uh, built up liberal support for new Cold War with Russia, uh, greater military spending, hostility towards Russia, uh, provide the excuse for uh, internet, greater internet, social media censorship. Everything was fake news, crackdown. Uh, also, you know, crackdown on the left, any, any alternate media, left or right. Also, any criticism of the Democratic Party from the left was Russian bots, which just shut down. It was a quite insidious narrative. It wasn't as bad as the original McCarthyism, but it was close. It wasn't quite nearly that bad, but it was pretty insidious. Okay, so Trump. Trump is a horrible guy, but it's important to keep in mind the Democrats uh, basically gave him his entire legislative agenda. First, they, they, they renewed, they gave him his, was it $730 billion military budget? They passed it. They renewed the Patriot Act, which was actually written by Joe Biden. 
Uh, oh, I don't know if he personally wrote it. I mean, his office had someone write it, but he wrote, he wrote most of it. Apparently this section, Patriot Act calls for a greater surveillance, the Department of Homeland Security, and which ICE is a part of. Apparently Biden, as far as I understand, didn't write that section that, that establishes DHS, but what he did write is, is bad enough. And he, he often brags about it. So they renewed, the Democrats renewed the Patriot Act. They gave Trump his massive corporate tax cut. Uh, they gave him the, the CARES Act, which supposedly was a stimulus during the pandemic, but it was a massive, this a $4 trillion bailout to corporate America. They gave him everything he wants. For someone who's supposedly a fascist, they, they gave him an enormous amount of power. Uh, Nancy Pelosi famously ripped up Trump's State of the Union address, but uh, right before redoing the Patriot Act, so it's kind of, they're Democrats who were never a credible opposition. The Russiagate narrative was promulgated as a way to fight Trump without actually fighting him, without doing anything meaningful, without uh, mobilizing mass opposition, which the Democrats are always very much afraid of. Okay, there is a deep state. Uh, liberals right now hate that term, and a lot of people on the left aren't too happy with it either. It's used by the right wing, and I'm not entirely sure how the right wing uses it. The term deep state came out of leftist analysis, more the analysis of a Turkey in the 1970s. Uh, the idea was Turkey had a lot of turmoil, had several uh, military took power several times, ostensibly to block conflict between left and right, but really to crack down on the left. Uh, later, the term of deep state meant that people were really ruined things. And it was later, this term was later, uh, uh, later uh, a little while later, uh, applied to Greece. And of course, every major like bourgeois democracy, industri major industrial democracy, they have elected governments come and go, but you know, the real you know, people run things, or the, the real people run things. France famously went through periods of chaos, but the French civil service kept things running. But they're also below that, a deeper layer of people really call the shots. In the US kind of US situation, I think a better term than deep state might be national security state, probably a better term. But would it be the uh, military industrial complex, which is gargantuan. It's gargantuan, like military budget less was, less military budget was 700 for, Fiscal year two, 2020 to 2021 is $730 billion about. Uh, for this for 2020 as a whole, apparently, according to Wikipedia, it's $940 billion, gargantuan, and most estimates say it's really close to a trillion dollars a year. It's, it's been steadily increasing since, since the end of the Cold War, but greater, greater level since 2015, I believe there's $60 billion since 2015. It's just insane, and it's politically very powerful. Uh, half of all federal discretionary spending is, is on the military. Um, the U.S. has spends more on its military than the next, I believe it's 10 countries combined, which is insane. The um, U.S. has at least 800 bases that we know about, another 200 which are not fully known about, and probably even more than that. Um, and it, there's nothing on the planet even close to it. And even, in, it's been extremely destructive. Uh, in, recent, in recent decades, the U.S. has destroyed Iraq. It went from being having a high standard of living in the Middle East, a large middle class, to now being what it is now, a war-torn hellhole. The U.S. did the same thing to Libya, whatever you want to say about Gaddafi. Uh, Libya had the highest standard of living in Africa. Now it's been if the U.S. got involved in a war-torn hellhole where slaves are openly sold, the U.S. was orchestrated under Trump, orchestrated coups in Venezuela, uh, two coups in Honduras, um, a coup in Bolivia, and a, as I understand, a coup in Paraguay as well. Nothing is close to it. Nothing is even close to the powers of U.S. imperialism. And I'll probably make a future video on U.S. imperialism, plays several military, gargantuan military, plays uh, several different complex roles, uh, keeps, maintains the U.S. as a center of global capital accumulation, uh, keeps prop up the value of the dollar. The U.S. has what's called right of seniorage, that is, is fiat, it's a fiat currency, and U.S. kind of coasts on this to an extent, and somewhat complicated, but Nothing on the planet is even close to U.S. imperialism. So the upshot of it is this deep state, this national security state, 
support support Biden, solidly support Biden. They didn't like Trump right from the beginning. This was evident in 2016 uh, primary, the Democratic National Convention had all these retired generals, uh, presumably lifelong conservative Republicans saying how much they support LGBT rights, for example, and how woke they were. It's even more so uh, this group, the uh, solidly within the campaign was behind Biden. Uh, they had, uh, was it um, 500 retired admirals and generals signed this thing supporting by supporting by 100 former McCain staffers and John McCain was a corrupt corrupt warmonger supported Biden the, the neocons the, the neocon establishment from top down Max Boot those other people supported Biden uh, the link at the Lincoln Republicans these are quite insidious forces this doesn't mean I like Trump Trump's any much of an alternative but Trump was seen as wrecking the empire. He was incompetent. He was ruining, ruining the image, ruining, badly ruining the brand. And much of U.S. authority, much of U.S. hegemony depends on soft power, people having some respect for the U.S. or thinking it's a force for good. Trump was taking the mask off, taking the fig leaf off. And uh, liberal, one of the main reasons they hated this, plus he, he was unstable, he was incompetent and unstable. They clearly did not. Well, they clearly were very much against him. Uh, so, you know, as far as Trump's claims of rigged elections, I don't know. The Democratic primaries were definitely rigged. I mean, it's interesting. Um, it's very interesting that um, Sanders, I didn't support Sanders, but I understand why people did. He was, you know, rallies, he got tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. Matt, he was one of the only few politicians in many U.S. history, many decades to get a following like that. He didn't do anything with it, dissipated, but he had following. Biden was lucky if he got a dozen people to go to his rallies. And he spent most of the campaign in his basement. Uh, odd that uh, Biden is the winner and uh, Bernie was, was pushed out. Um, there's exit polls in the primaries. Many of the primaries where Trump, where Biden won, uh, showed that uh, exit polls showed Bernie way ahead but the actual results were uh, well very low, lower for for uh, uh, for uh, for Bernie. Something was going on. I mean, it's kind of understood. That in 2016, we definitely know it was rigged, and the the, the Iowa the, the thing with the app and the Iowa caucuses. To, everything was designed to keep marginalized Sanders. And then, of course, Obama got involved. The, the famous phone calls got the uh, Klobuchar and Buttigieg to ba to, to to back out to to withdraw. Uh, Elizabeth Warren stayed in long enough just to hurt, hurt Sanders, and she came off as a craven opportunist. And then Obama made a famous phone call to, to, to Sanders, convinced him to drop out. And it was uh, uh, Biden, who was an unpopular guy with no following. He had won one primary, and people expected him to drop out. Actually, he emerged as, a, as, he, uh, as the front runner, and he, he, now he's the president. Um, there are claims of Trump's claims that the Democrats rigged it. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's one, the Conro Couch, which is a leftist YouTube channel I watch. They, they forgot themselves as election integrity activists. They claim, you know, they, they say, we don't like Trump. We hate Trump. But, you know, it could be the Democrats really did rig the elections. I, I don't know. I haven't followed it that closely. Uh, Dem the Republicans famously use voter suppression, really black people in the South, very blatantly. So they use the suppression, uh, while the Democrats rigged their own internal elections. It's kind of well known, kind of well known. So I don't really know. So the ruling class clearly wanted Trump out. There was the uh, famous was the uh, transition or, uh, integrity or election integrity project. Whitney Webb and Diane Johnston, a few other people, uh, uh, talked about this. It was a role playing game, role playing exercise at Harvard. Well, it was real. It's not a conspiracy theory. It actually happens. Well documented. There were people from the Clinton campaign. John Podesta was there, as well as some other people. Lots of other people. And they played. There uh, was initially uh, to guarantee like a, a, a fair transition, like Trump was going to pull any pull any shenanigans. Uh, but part of this had part of the scenario was where Trump won by a wide margin. And the scenario called for a military coup, literally against Trump. Um, I don't know how likely that would have been, but I read the ruling class wanted Trump out. And I don't think there's much chance he would have won. Uh, he would have been allowed to win. There was a lot of um, fear that Trump was going to pull a coup. 
Trump is going to cancel the elections or ignore the results. Um, I think that was absurd. There was no pos ever any possibility that would happen. First, Trump never had military, military or institutional support. Any like fascist, classic fascist dictators, Hitler and Mussolini, they had institutional support. Hitler had support of the German army and major industrialists. Mussolini, after the March on Rome, was it 1921, I believe, he had support in some of the aristocracy of Italy. They had support. Trump didn't have it. Trump, Trump, Trump had, um, you know, the right wing militias. They weren't going to, they, they were no match against overweight guys with beer bellies and assault rifles weren't going to take over the country. Uh, same, the same thing with some people claim that, you know, um, the ICE and Border Patrol are pers personal loyalty to Trump. That may be true, but they, they, they would be no match either. Um, the, the attempt uh, in Wisconsin uh, to kidnap the right wing group, the attempt to militia, murky militia to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, I kind of suspect, I don't know this for sure. But I suspect it was set up by the FBI. Uh, and during the Bush administration, the FBI did this kind of stuff all the time. They ran these entrapment operations at least several times. They sort of foiled a Muslim terrorist, terrorist uh, cell, terrorist plot. It was basically they formed this thing on, recruit people online, some alienated kids, immigrant kids, stupid alienated kids. They got them all riled up and got, got them into this conspiracy and then they nabbed them. They did the same thing with uh, so the leftist conspiracy. And this is well-documented guy, FBI informant from New Orleans who became active in uh, anarchist circles, Brendan Darby. He actually recruited and coached a group of these kids, young, young kids who were rightly pissed off the system, but they didn't know what to do about it. He coached them to make Molotov cocktails and he brought them in a van. He actually coached them and pushed them to do this. And then uh, to the Molotov cocktails they're going to use at the Republican National Convention was uh, 2004. Then the FBI, the kids were completely set up. And, and so the, the, then the FBI nabbed them, the feds nabbed them, and they did use. So and this ruined people's lives, people years in jail for this. Uh, this was under Mueller, who was supposed to be a liberal hero during the Russiagate narrative. Um, narrative back then was that Muslims are going to destroy our country. Muslim terrorism is a major threat. And we got to depend on the security state to crack down Muslims in alliance with leftists or destroying. They hate us because we, for, we're, we, cause, we hate us because of our freedom. Nonsense like that. Now the narrative was that if Trump is reelected, we're going to have a fascist takeover. I don't think that was ever popular. Um, ever, ever possible. I, I don't know this for sure, but I strongly suspect the plot was, was cooked up by the FBI. I don't know this for sure. Uh, I'm not discounting the, these militias. They are scary. They are dangerous. I'm not, not discounting them. Um, Michigan particularly is known for militia movement. Uh, the, it's the dynamics from the auto industry. Detroit is mostly a black city and they've had a long history of uh, radical movements. And then there's the hinterland, uh, largely white, hit, hard hit by deindustrialization. So some of the dynamics, uh, the dynamics gave rise to, to militia movements, right wing militia movements. Also, much as the militia movements predate Trump, they date back to the, to the early 90s, about neoliberalism the industrialization and also the Gulf War. The first, first Gulf War was the Operation Desert Storm. Uh, people came back from that kind of shattered and they were alienated, pissed off. And no really radicalized pity bourgeois layer. Uh, Trump did not control them or command them and they weren't even really part of the same movement. They used each other. But the narrative looked like Trump was running this fascist coup and which was misreading, I think it was badly misreading the, the situation. And it gave us this almost hysteria levels of fear. Like you gotta vote for Biden. Biden was a corrupt corporate hack and had no appeal. And he was, uh, it was a rigged election, but this would give justification to vote vote for, for, uh, for Biden. Now, I don't think Biden's an alternative. I really don't think, I think actually he's probably the, the worst evil. Not that I support Trump. I have no support for Trump, but not that um, Biden is the worst evil. He hard these really horrible forces which have gathered around him. I think we're starting to have a war someplace, military industrial complex, the national security state, the, the neocons, the warmongers are, yeah, there. And look at his cabinet appointments already are really kind of disturbing. They're just as bad as Trump. Um, 
the rhetoric has got to be nicer. The real LGBT, like I think the uh, head of the CIA is a, a black Jew, I guess, <laughs> from the Caribbean, one thing I've heard. Another, Buttigieg is openly gay, he's transportation secretary. Uh, there's woke LGBT nominee, nominees, but they're, you know, they're, they're pretty horrible. Uh, popular term called um, called uh, intersectional imperialism. Yeah, that's exactly right. Using identity politics in the service of like uh, imperialism, horrific. So that's what we're up against. I think the uh, radical left, the anti-capitalist left, has to clearly in the coming period. It's kind of scary. Many people have said, you know, if Biden gets in. Uh, whoever comes next will be worse than Trump. You need four more years of neoliberalism and austerity, which is starting to happen. Only have a woke face. So you're going to be a reaction even worse than Trump. People, maybe Tom Cotton, maybe somebody else. I mean, much, much worse. More years of neoliberalism. So the radical left, I think, a task is to clearly differentiate themselves from the Democrats and from Biden. And we're not, we're not, we're not those people. We're not, you know, those woke. I mean, I, I support LGBT rights, obviously, and of course, but it's used in the service of imperialism. The left has to clearly differentiate itself. That's the most important task. And it's hard to do if you've already been campaigning for Biden, even by like so many people on the left, I mean, radical left or socialist decades of activism, the socialist movement have been trying to get people to vote for Biden, hot terror about other Trump, overreaction against Trump. And it's extremely damaging there and hard to differentiate yourself if you're getting, if you're in the Democratic Party already.